Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yahata Teruko. I'm very happy to be able to talk to you today. This is a map of Hiroshima at the time of the atomic bombing. This is the hypocenter, 2.5 kilometers west of the hypocenter, it's Koi Station, now called Nishi Hiroshima Station. Somewhere in between the JR line and the river was our house. And that where we were when the atomic bomb was dropped. This is a New Year photograph taken when I was only three years old. My mother, my father, my elder sister, younger brother, and in the center, me. Just under one year later, on December 18th, 1945, 1941, when I was four years old, the Pacific War broke out. The painting and sketches that you will see in this PowerPoint were produced by students of Hiroshima City Motomachi High School Art Department and were made over the course of about a year after listening to my testimony. I was eight years old when the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. The previous year, I had been enrolled in the Hiroshima City National School in Koi. Upon entering the gate, I immediately noticed that the cherry blossom was in full bloom, and the foreign petals had transformed the ground into a light pinky peach colored carpet. The radio was broadcasting an announcement from Imperial Headquarters, and a brave voice resonated. We have successfully attacked and sunk an enemy aircraft carrier with no significant damage to our side. But gradually, the situation on the battlefield was worsening. Even so, after morning assembly, a senior student was seen marching and singing. In exchange for one life, I'd slash hundreds and thousands. It seemed that they are convinced that Japan would be victorious and that the decisive and determined mainland battle was being fought. On that fateful day, the sky overhead was clear and sunny, and it was a fresh morning. We lived 2.5 kilometers from the hypocenter in our family home in Koi Honmachi. My paternal great grandmother, grandmother, parents, older sister, me and two younger brothers, eight members in total. After breakfast, in order to go next door, I stepped down into the garden. At that moment, and all of a sudden, the entire sky flashed and was illuminated in bluish white. 
as if the heavens had become a huge flow of lessons light. I immediately fell to the ground and lost consciousness. Everyone, let's get together here. I was awoken by the sound of my mother's voice calling out and by the image of my father carrying my great-grandmother on his back. There was so much smoke in there that I could barely see. The inside of the house had been turned upside down from the shattered grass, from the sliding door was everywhere. It was like we had been stabbed with a mighty spear. I had been thrown by the force of the blast six meters from the back garden to the entrance of the house. Let's die together while we are still together. My mother pleaded from the ruins and began to pull futons and bedding from the cupboard. As she did so, I noticed that there were fragments of grass sticking out of her bag. And her white blouse was now stained a bloody red. We thought that there was sure to be a second and perhaps a third bomb. So we believed that we are beyond saving. As she spread out our large futon over us all, I remember, and indeed we will never forget what it felt like as a child to be surrounded by my entire close family in the warmth and security of that blanket. There was an eerie silence outside, and virtually all of the houses surrounding ours were destroyed. We had fled to the mountainside when the huge drops of rain began to fall, and it soaked us to the skin. There was no need for us to know at the time that this was the so-called black rain. While we are turning back towards the river bank of Koi, we froze in our steps as we encounter people fleeing from the city. Their hair was standing on end, and their bodies were sometimes completely burned. They were covered in dust, and the skin that was peeling off their arms and dangling from their fingertips resembled old Tatar's rugs. The saw and crippled figure of tens and hundreds of bodies were flocking towards us like a region of ghosts. A relative had come to search for us and we are fortunate enough to be evacuated to their house. The city continued to burn all through the night. As the sun went down, some neighbors came to visit. 
I couldn't take my eyes off what they had brought with them. Could it be the box lined with snow white rice balls was a meal for us, the victims? I was so hungry and so very happy that I was speechless. The image of those beautiful rice balls that we each received is etched on my memory for eternity. I cannot describe the great pleasure I take in eating white rice. And even now, it fills my heart with joy to make someone, anyone, a fresh rice bowl. A heat of the rice, turning palms red as I shape each one carefully, one by one. Fortunately, my family had escaped with only minor injuries. In order to receive treatment for the wound to my forehead, my father had taken me to seek first aid at the school. Upon entering the gate, I was horrified to be met with agonizing screams and moans. In the hallways and classrooms, the floor was strewn with tightly packed bodies. Faces blistered so badly that they could no longer open their eyes. The dead were being taken outside to the sports ground on makeshift stretchers and rows of holes had been dug for the clusters of bodies to be thrown into. In the midsummer heat, a flickering hedge rose above the burning flames and the bodies of the people working to simmer and quiver in the intense heat. And the smoke and the repulsive stench seemed to have filled every corner of the school. In the midst of all this, something caught my eye on a table near the school gate. Rows of postcard size white paper bags. They must be handing out seeds. I thought to myself, I was starving, so headed straight for the sign. It was with shock that I then found that the box were not with sweets, but with the bones of the unidentified cremated. The relative could then at least take something back home for the memorial service. I was later told. Amongst the recorded 2,000 bodies that were cremated here, a large number of whom were sacrificed during building demolition duty were first and second grade students. How much pain did they suffer? How much did they really want to continue living? They lost everything in the moment.
Even now, occasionally, other recollections and scenes from those times still haunt me. Next door to the house of a relative in Koi, where we thought we had sought refuge. An older girl, then a student, had returned from with severe bound. It was midsummer, and door to the room where she slept had been left open. Next to her pillow was a small pot. I was so hungry because there was nothing to eat. I couldn't help but think that inside the pot there was some candy. Once I saw her open the lid of the pot, it seemed that she was using the pot to spit out the blood. Over and over, she opened, then slept. Was open, then slept. She died, coughing up blood. From the day when the atomic bomb was dropped in 1945 to the end of the year, it is said that the death toll had reached approximately 140,000 people. That the exact figure is not known is testament indeed to the ultimately destructive nature of the atomic bomb. Both the immediate and long-term effects of the atomic bomb manifested themselves in different ways. And those who seemed to escape from direct exposure to the blast later develop an array of horrific symptoms. A girl who I went to school with as a junior and senior high school student, Suetsu Kimiko was a bright and cheerful girl. Pretty as a picture in her summer Sarah school uniform. She was only eight years old when she was exposed to the atomic bomb just over one kilometer from the hypocenter. One day, 16 years later, spots began to appear on her arms, and she was troubled by the malaise and washout feeling, which had suddenly swept over her. She was diagnosed with acute leukemia. She had a high fever, swelling of the face, and a sensation that she was carrying red around in her chest. In spite of her suffering, however, she still wished to live right up until the very end. And I can clearly recall her words. I want to look up at the bright blue sky 
wearing the beautiful dress and shoes too much, and then to dance like Cinderella. I have nothing to complain about to anyone. I just want to get better and to live, to live. She died the following year at the still tender age of 25. In 2013, I took part in a peace boat round the world voyage for atomic bomb witnesses and survivors. With regret, I realized once again the cruelty and ugliness of war. And that once a war is started, we become both perpetrator and victim. We were all born on this huge planet. And although our countries and languages are different, we all belong to the same era. In the course of a century, or even just a human lifespan, the sun rises and the sun falls. And there are irrepressible days that are brought back to us in surges or in waves. Who do you love? What do you love? If a single nuclear weapon was used now, mankind would cease to exist. All that I have left to do is to communicate the truth of the atomic bomb to the world and to continue to sound the alarm bells. Thank you very much for listening.